down. Operation Christmas Child, uh, it is that time of year again. Uh, we have a group of men who are going to be up here uh, filling the shoe boxes. Uh, not filling them, but uh, structuring them, putting them together. Uh, and I'm, I'm guessing, I think that's Dean back there, they'll be available out there next Sunday. Is that right? Okay. So beginning Wednesday, it uh, be a safe bet for you to, to, uh, to come get one of those. Uh, and then we've got uh, Angel Tree stuff coming up. And then our church-wide uh, Thanksgiving, uh, ne- next, not next Sunday night, but the next, on the 20th, uh, we'll have Gordon Fort here from the International Mission Board and, uh, and our annual uh, Thanksgiving meal. You can read about all the details, what you need to bring on what will be provided there in your bulletin. And then I want to also mention that next Sunday evening, during our evening worship time at 6 o'clock, uh, we will be licensing and ordaining, it gets a double whammy, uh, Clint Bryant to the ministry, and uh, we're excited about that. We know that God's called him, and we see that calling evident in his life. And, uh, and so I'm excited about that opportunity to be able to, to do that for, for him, and, and uh, we've spent some time with him this afternoon, and just really excited about the future of our church and, and his future as God continues to use he and Jenna in our student ministry. So that's next Sunday evening at our 6 o'clock worship time. We'll, again, ordain Clint and license him, and, uh, and his father-in-law will be here to preach uh, his ordination service. So I'm excited about that, and I hope you are too. So let me, uh, let me open us with a word of prayer, and then we'll greet each other tonight. Lord, we just love you so much, and we thank you for, uh, for who you are and for what you do for us. We thank you for salvation. We thank you this, for this morning that we, we got to sing about the blood of Jesus that, that cleanses us from all unrighteousness, and that is our victory. And Lord, we, we pray this, uh, this evening that everything we do, everything we say, uh, would be honoring and pleasing to you, uh, and, uh, and that, um, Lord, that, that we would just leave here uh, refreshed and ready for a week uh, to, uh, to work and to go to school and to, and to live life uh, on mission with you. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, greet the people around you, and welcome them to Taylor Road. make your way back to your seats. We have a special treat tonight. You can have a seat when you get back. Make sure there's one behind you before you sit down. Have a special treat tonight. And I just want to thank our, our leaders of our children's choir back in the, in the summer. We were praying hard, or you guys were, and I, st- I joined you the, as I talked with Daniel about a children's choir director and leaders to kind of step in and help with our kids. And um, I'm thankful for Jan Burdett and Beth M- Malik. They kind of stepped in and took the reins. Uh, they have help from Ms., Mr. Guthrie Jeffcoat. He makes the operation look good, and he's helping out that way. And, and then Miss Betty Gallops is um, accompanying them on the piano, and they're doing an amazing job. You're going to see that in just a minute as you listen to these beautiful kids sing. And I'm thankful to have so many kids up here, and uh, our, uh, our adult choir is in good. You know, we got a good future coming up. So they look good already sitting up here, and they're going to lead us now as they sing soon and very soon and tell me the story of Jesus.
Well, amen. Y'all give them another round of applause and tell them thank you for leading us in worship. They'll be leading us on December 11th in our evening service with a Christmas program entitled Main Street, Christmas on Main Street. So you'll be able to look forward to that, mark that on your calendars, but December 11th, all right, in the evening service. Y'all's turn now, all right? Y'all stand up. We're going to sing together, continue to worship. So we sing about the wonderful friend that we have in Jesus. I'm sorry, I didn't cue my instrumentalist, so we're going to stand here a little awkwardly for a minute. But aren't you thankful for our, our leaders, Miss Jan, Miss Beth, Miss Betty, and Mr. Guthrie? Thankful for them and stepping up to do that for us. friend in Jesus, he's everything to me, he's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul, the lily of the valley, in him alone I see, all I need to cleanse and make me fully whole, in sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my state, he tells me every care on him to roll, he's the lily of the valley, bright and morning star he's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul he all my grief has taken and all my sorrows born in temptation he's my strong and mighty tower i have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn from my heart and now he keeps me by his power He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do His blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I have nothing now to fear. With this man I eat my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul.
Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to praise your name, the, the honor of being able to sing songs that express words of your greatness and your glory, Lord. And we're so thankful that you love us and that you care about us. And Lord, we are thankful that we have this church and this place where we can worship in this world. And as we look ahead to the week ahead, Lord, we pray that we would look to you for wisdom and for guidance in all the decisions and things that are affect our lives. For it is through you that these things can be delivered and only through you. We thank you for all that you do for us and how you love us. In Christ's name we do pray, amen. an old rugged cross on that cross a battle is raging for the king a man's soul or his loss on one side march the forces of evil all the demons and the devils of hell. On the other, the angels of glory, and they meet on Golgotha's hill. The earth shakes with the force of the conflict. The sun refuses to shine, for there hangs God's sun in the balance, and then through the darkness he cries, it is finished, the battle. be no more war. It is finished, the end of the conflict. It is finished, Jesus is Lord. Yet in my heart, the battle was raging. Not all prisoners of war had come home. These were battlefields of my own making. I didn't know that the war had been won. But then I heard that the king of all the ages had fought all my battles for me and the victory was mine for the claiming and now praise his name i am free it is finished the battle is over be no more war. It is finished, the end of the conflict. It is finished, Jesus is Lord. It is finished, the end of the conflict. It is finished, Jesus is Lord. Lord. 
Thank you, Robert. Thank you, kids. It was good singing tonight. Uh, I wanted to um, change direction a little bit uh, this evening. First of all, I want to let you know, I meant to do this at the very beginning of, uh, of our time together, but this morning we as a church family uh, voted on who will serve us as, as deacons in the coming year, and, uh, and so you as a church have uh, decided that we would call Conrad Misseldine, Mike Simpkins, Wayne Miller, and Jamie Saxon to service in the new year. And so we thank God for those men and, uh, and what we look forward to the, the days ahead as a church and, uh, and serving him and the people here at Taylor Road. Um, I, do ha- I did have a message you see in your bulletin um, that I had notes even. I was, I was on top of things this last week. Um, but as he, as he typically does, the Lord uh, changed that, that message last night and kind of the direction that I felt like he wanted me to, he wanted me to take um, this evening and, uh, and just really kind of focus in on a couple of things and, and call uh, our church family um, to just a time, <clears throat> excuse me, time of prayer uh, this evening for several different things, and, and, and I, I just want you to know, there, I, I don't really have a, st- a structure in terms of, you know, you getting pods or anything like that, but when, it, when, we, when we get ready to pray, if you feel led to, to come to this altar and, and pour your heart out or kneel right there at your chair or gather with a group of people, it, it's kind of one of those most anything goes kind of thing. I say most anything because it could be anything, and we don't, <laughs> don't want to get too crazy, but, um, but anyway, I felt, I really felt um, led to again to just call us to a, a special time of prayer. This is a this is a crucial point uh, for our nation this week. But I want to be clear uh, on the front end here um, that this this is not a call tonight. This is not a focus on praying for a particular candidate or a particular party or really not even the election as much as it is to just call us to prayer to intercede for our nation. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for Tuesday. <laughs> Simply to end the commercials and end, end just the chatter and the talk and the going back and forth. I'm just, I'm just tired of it. But it, what breaks my heart is to see just how divided our nation is and where we are as a people and, and how far we've come and how far we've fallen and, and the Lord gave me a few passages of Scripture that I wanted to share with you through our time tonight. Um, and, and I'm always cautious, and I hope, you, I hope you've picked up about on, on this about me since I've been here. But I'm always real cautious about um, reading and comparing America to Old Testament texts and Old Testament nations, especially Israel. I don't in any way think that America is is the new Israel or anything like that. But I do believe very firmly that there are some things that have never changed, and that is God uh, and His character and His nature and His ways. Uh, That has never changed and it never will change. God's dealings with nations does not change uh, because human hearts have not changed. Uh, human hearts are still wicked. Jeremiah said that, that the heart is wicked and it's deceitful. Uh, and I think that's just as true in 2016 as it was in, in, in the B.C. era. Um, you know, so, so there are some things that don't change. I don't read America into the Scriptures. Uh, I'm not one of these guys that's going to ever come up here and preach with a, you know, a, a flannel graph, you know, a backdrop of timeline or anything like that, and America's going to be on. That's just, that's not me. Um, and, and so, but I want to be careful in saying that at the very outset. But the Lord did bring to my heart some, some passages of Scripture that I think are very pertinent to where we are spiritually speaking. And the first one is Isaiah, I mean, not Isaiah, Ezekiel chapter 36. If you'll turn to Ezekiel chapter 36, and I want to go ahead and just kind of give you a heads up. Some of the, some of the language, the descriptive language in this is pretty rough. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of speed right through it uh, so that you parents don't have to answer too many questions on the, on the way home tonight. Uh, but Ezekiel chapter 36 is... God, and, and, and I've I spent some time reading through Ezekiel this afternoon, and God's warnings to different nations, and God's um, uh, declaration of judgment on different nations, and why he was 
judging those nations. And I'm going to tell you, it's really, it's, it's frightening to read the reasons why he was judging these nations and to think that if he judged them for these things, um, what is keeping him from pouring out his, his wrath on us for the same exact things, um, almost. But Isaiah, I mean, Ezekiel chapter 36 um, God speaks, and, and this is a lengthy passage, but it's, it's important. I want to I read through it slowly and carefully with you here, except in those, those sketchy areas we'll speed right through. But anyway, it says, And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel, and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, because the enemy said of you, Aha, and the ancient heights have become our possession, Therefore prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God, precisely because they made you desolate and crushed you from all sides so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations and you became the talk and evil gossip of the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and the hills, the ravines and the valleys, the desolate wastes and the deserted cities, which have become a prey and derision to the rest of the nations all around. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Surely I have spoken in my hot jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all Edom, who gave my land to themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and utter contempt, that they, may, they, that they might make its pasture lands a prey." Again, God is speaking against the nations who have attacked Israel and have destroyed Israel. He is now saying, I'm going to defend my people. He says in verse 6, Therefore, prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains and hills, to the ravines and valleys, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealous wrath because you have suffered the reproach of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I swear... That the nations that are all around you shall themselves suffer reproach. But you, O mountains of Israel, shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they will soon come home. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. And I will multiply people on you, the whole house of Israel, all of it. The city shall be inhabited and the waste places rebuilt. And I will multiply on you man and beast, and they shall multiply and be fruitful. And I will cause you to be inhabited as in your former times, and will do more good to you than ever before. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I will let people walk on you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess you, and you shall be their inheritance. And you shall no longer bereave them of children." Thus says the Lord God, because they say to you, you devour people and you bereave your nation of children. Therefore, you shall no longer devour people and no longer bereave your nation of children, declares the Lord God. And I will not let you hear any more the reproach of the nations and you shall no longer bear the disgrace of the peoples and no longer cause your nation to stumble, declares the Lord God. This is good news for Israel. God's going to restore them. And the word of the Lord in verse 16, came to me, son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual impurity. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed in the land, for the idols with which they had defiled it. I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed through the countries. In accordance with their ways and their deeds, I judged them. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name. In that people said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they had to go out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate my holiness. Uh, Let's see. I vindicate my holiness of my great name. uh, And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, 
when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather, from, gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and it will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleanness and I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good and you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominations. It's not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities, the cities to be inhabited and the waste places to be rebuilt. And the land that was desolate shall be tilled instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left all around you shall know that I am the Lord. I have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which was desolate. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. Thus says the Lord God, this also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them. To increase their people like a flock like the flock of sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feast, so shall the waste cities be filled with the flocks of people. Then they will know that I am the Lord. And reading that and understanding that the context is specific and unique to Israel and her place in history and in God's redemptive story, but also to understand that there are some things about God that do not change. And there are some things that he takes very seriously that do not change. And there are his reactions to these things that break his heart, infuriate him, that have not changed. And things that we, as a people, uh, are, are guilty of. And, and, and a couple of those things, a few of those things, I, I just made a list as I was reading through Ezekiel chapter 36. Some of the things, you see that, that the beginning and the end of this chapter is, is God promising restoration of Israel. But the middle section of the chapter was, was God explaining and reminding the people of why they were in the position they were in in the first place. God didn't, it broke his heart to drive them out of the land. It broke God's heart to allow conquering nations to come in and, and desolate them and to destroy them and to, and to just ransack everything. It broke God's heart to see this. But he did it because of his holiness and because they had turned their backs on the covenant that they had made with him. And some of the things that, that they had, were guilty of that brought this punishment and brought God's judgment, again, I just jotted some of the things down because, again, I think that God is still just as passionate about these things today. And the first thing that I think God takes very seriously that I think we are guilty of is he is very passionate about his, his holy name, the name of God. It, if you read here, God says, you blasphemed my name in the land. And then he says, I, I drove you out of the land by conquering nations. And not only did you blaspheme my name in the land that I gave you, but then when you went into Babylon and all the other different nations that took you captive, you blasphemed my name there too. God is passionate about his holy name about his holiness the name of god is above every other name the name of god speaks to the character and the nature of god and what god's people had done is they had blasphemed his name they had tarnished his name they had tarnished his reputation and everywhere you look near about in America in 2016, the name of God is being blasphemed. It's being blasphemed in the media. 
It's being blasphemed in pop culture. It's being blasphemed. And listen, it's not just taking the Lord's name in vain. It's being blasphemed by the church, by the people of God who are living in sin, claiming to be followers of God, all doing it under the name of God. The name of God is blasphemed. And I think what infuriated God just as much, if not more so, is that his people were blaspheming his name and then, and then they were to be spread. God, God still had a purpose when he sent them into exile, when he allowed them to go into exile, they were to be, Isaiah said, they were to be a light of salvation to the nations. In other words, they were living in exile. They were living out as strangers out of their home out of their homeland, but God still expected them to be representatives of him, to point all the nations to him, and yet they blasphemed his name. And listen, the church of God in the United States of America and Western culture has blasphemed his name so that the lost world looks at us and says, why would we want to believe that? They, they live just like we do. They don't look any different than we do. God is very passionate about the holiness of his name. Secondly, God is very passionate about the sanctity of life. God is extremely passionate about the sanctity of life. Now, he says here that one of the reasons, one of the ways that they blasphemed his name is by the bloodshed that they had committed. If you read through the rest of Ezekiel, you see that many of the nations that God judged and God uh, God brought his wrath upon, were guilty of child sacrifice. If you read also that uh, in the scriptures, they were also guilty of killing innocent people, all for the sake of getting land and possessions and wealth. They were, they were just slaughtering innocent people. God is extremely, extremely, extremely passionate, I believe, about the sanctity of life. Now, that goes from conception to death. God is serious about the sanctity of life within the womb. And we're a nation that's killed over 60 million babies since Roe v. Wade. God is passionate and serious about the sanctity of life among the poor among those who are, who are less fortunate, the disadvantaged, and yet we have more slums in this nation than any other nation in the world. Homelessness is at an all-time high. God is serious about human life. God is serious, and, and I, I don't mean to ruffle feathers, and I'm not being political, I'm just stating the facts. God is serious about the sanctity of the life of immigrants and those who are foreigners and strangers. Go read about his relationship with Israel. He always told them, that was one of the covenant rules, be kind and accepting the strangers and aliens among you. Esther, not Esther, Ruth, sorry. Ruth, prime example. God cares about the sanctity of life. He cares about the sanctity of life of the elderly. God cares from beginning conception to death about all human life. And we are a nation that doesn't take it as seriously as he does. The third thing that I think, the third area that God is serious about here in this passage, and other passages as well, particularly in Leviticus chapter 18, is human sexuality. Marriage. You see, God refers to idolatry here. And much of the practices that went along with pagan idolatry was sexual immorality. When God's people were dispersed into foreign lands, um, many times, most of the time, in fact, this is what he was referring to, they adopted the religion and the practices of the pagans that they were living among. And God takes human sexuality, marriage, very seriously. And we're a nation that has told God we have a better idea. I've heard the argument, you've heard the argument, that marriage is a cultural issue. That marriage is 
evolving our understanding of human sexuality and uh, marriage and and all that is is evolving and it's a cultural because culture is changing and cultural ideas have changed therefore our our understanding of marriage is changing Uh, to quote tony evans marriage and sexuality is not a cultural issue it is a creation issue god got it right the first time and he doesn't need our help and we have turned our backs i mean why why do you think paul's analogy of The church's relationship with Jesus is that of a bride with her groom. Human sexuality is at the core of creation. And the way God created is the way that he is passionate about and serious about. And we are a nation that is, like Israel and the other pagan nations of the Old Testament, we have turned our backs and blasphemed God in that way. Proverbs chapter 14. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, second wisest man, second to Jesus, said this, and this touches on the sanctity of life and some of the other issues that I just mentioned. He says in Proverbs chapter 14, listen to this, whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. The wicked is overthrown through his evil doing, but the righteous finds refuge in his death. Wisdom rests in the heart of a man of understanding, but it makes itself known even in the midst of fools. Here's the verse I want us to cling to. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I want to call us at this time to just go before the Lord and just pray that God would bring His people, the church, to a place of repentance. The church in America has fallen so far from where God has called us and created us to be and that we would intercede for our nation. That we would pray for the church. God would bring repentance and healing. But he would, that we would also pray for our nation. A nation that has blasphemed the name of God. A nation that has blasphemed God's view of the sanctity of life from conception to death. A nation that has blasphemed God's creation of human sexuality. And so I just want to invite you, if you feel led to come to the altar... If you feel led to grab someone there, pray with them there. I want to I ask you now, just to enter into a time of prayer. If you want to pray out loud, you pray out loud. I just want to call this whole body of Christ to, to pray for just a few moments. Praying and interceding for our nation. And then I'm going to lead us in a couple of other areas. So if you, again, if you feel led to come down to this altar, you do so at this time.
Heavenly Father, we are reminded tonight that you are a holy God. And you are chiefly concerned with your glory and your holiness and your name. And God, I'm reminded of Moses who came down from the mountain to see your people building a golden cow committing all forms of sexual uh, immorality, idolatry, drunkenness. And how Moses stood in the gap and pleaded with you and interceded for them with you that you would spare them. And he even offered his own life in their place. And God, I believe that you call your church, your people, to do the same. Lord, I believe that the role, part of the role of the church in the culture is to stand in the gap. And God, we understand that we are citizens of your kingdom. We are citizens of heaven as your people. But we are also citizens of this, this nation. And God, this is a nation that has blasphemed your name. America has was founded on the principles of your word. It has honored you in, in, uh, for many years in many ways, but God, uh, over time, um, Lord, we've become increasingly secular and increasingly more and more bold in our blasphemy of the Holy God. Lord, as your word says in Romans chapter 1, we profess to be wise, but we are in fact fools. Every man is doing what is right in his own eyes. God, we are a nation that has blasphemed the holiness of your name. We've blasphemed the sanctity of life created in your image. Lord, we're a nation that has murdered more children that have died in, in all the wars that we fought. God, to think of who you might have had as the next great preacher of this nation, the next great spiritual leader that we have sacrificed to the God of self. Lord, we're a nation that has blasphemed you in regards to human sexuality. And Lord, we, we come tonight interceding for our nation, asking you to be merciful. Lord, as your word says, that if your people who are called by your name will humble themselves, seek your face and turn from their wicked ways, then you will heal us. And so Lord, we understand that healing begins with your church, with your people, your your sons and your daughters who have become more like the world than we've become like you, confessing our sin to you, God. I pray for revival in your church. I pray for renewal and awakening in this land. And Lord, I pray that each of us would understand that revival begins with us. And Lord, I pray that it would spread through our neighborhoods and through our city through our state and through our nation. And we just pray, <clears throat> Father, for you to be merciful. Lord, don't give us what we deserve. And Lord, we just pray, Father, that we would just <clears throat> be a nation that honors you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name. As you remain in a spirit of prayer, I want to call you to one more area of prayer. And that's for God's will and God's leadership. You can remain at the altar if you like or go back to your seat, whatever, whatever is most comfortable for you. But I want to read just a few verses. Ultimately, what happens this Tuesday is going to be no surprise to the king. But in Psalm chapter 33... 
verses 8 through 22, and this is a good, I believe this is a good word for us. For those of us that may, uh, may be fearful, may have doubts, may be confident, you may be praying for wisdom, or you may just hold your nose and go in the booth, whatever your situation is. Listen to what the psalmist writes. In Psalm chapter 33, Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to Him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all His work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. and By its great might, it cannot rescue. As the psalmist would go on to say, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, some trust in the strength and the might of man, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. Verse 18, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in the famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. My prayer for us and my prayer as we leave this place tonight is that our hope would not be, as the psalmist says, in the war horse. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. But our hope is in the Lord. And our soul waits on him. I want to just invite you to spend the next couple of moments, maybe right there where you are again, if you want to come down to the altar. But would you just turn your heart toward Him and rest in Him? Because we know that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer and we'll close in just a moment. Heavenly Father, we just uh, we come to you at this time now and as we prepare to leave this place. And God, we just ask that uh, as your people, we would see this world and see this nation through not a political lens or an American lens, but through a gospel lens. And in what, ref- what comfort for the soul it is to read the words of the psalmist that you are the one who fashions the hearts of men. You are the one whose plans cannot be frustrated. You frustrate the counsels of the nations, and you frustrate 
our plans and you have decreed all things and as your word also says you direct the hearts of kings just as you do the streams Lord we trust you and we thank you for the truth that this world is not our home that we await a new heaven and a new earth free from sin free from brokenness that our, our main objective on this earth as your, as your citizens, as the citizens of your kingdom, as the citizens of heaven, our main objective is to live as children of light. To glorify our Father in heaven. To bring much name and renown, our fame and renown to the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray again for our nation. We pray that you would just do a great work among this church in this city to bring the hope of the gospel to many people and do the same for all of the churches in our nation that name the name of Jesus. That you would use the church or to bring revival and awakening in this land. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing a song. It's a song that I'm sure most of you know. I have decided to follow Jesus. And one of the verses in there, I hope we're going to do, the world behind me, the cross before me. Well, let's just sing this like we've never sung it before tonight. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. read this last week that those words were actually the last words by a martyr uh, a few centuries ago in the public square as he was given a chance to recant his faith. Uh, those were his dying words that were penned by someone in the crowd. Uh, and so keep that in mind this week, the world behind me, the cross before me. We're going to be dismissed. Uh, if, if you are a visitor with us or you're not a member here at, at our church, you are free to go. Uh, but folks, if you would mind, if you were a member of our church, just stick around for a couple of minutes. Uh, we are going to, uh, we're going to enter into a time of business. So you guys have a great rest of the week, and we will start in about two minutes. So.